So I also want to give my thanks to, uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me to come and talk to the, about soybean. Um, this slide was originally t entitled Making Use of the Soybean Genome, and then I realized that we probably want to make good use of the genome and not just uh, use, so I changed it. Before I start, if you work on a commodity, and I'm probably uh, preaching to the choir here, but if you work on a commodity like soybean, very often get in these audiences where there are people in the audience that really feel that the only money that should be spent should be spent on applied research, or I guess the new word is translational research. And I think in a way the, the genomics and genome sequencing is really a wonderful example of how what I think most people would consider basic research, that is getting the genome sequence, really leads to a lot of translational applications. And so uh, the point really is that the idea of applied versus uh, basic research is really a false choice. The example that I use is if I get up in front of an audience and I say that I just uh, discovered a new mousetrap, the, the, the world's best mousetrap, what's the first question you're going to ask me? How does it work? Which, is, of course, is basic research, right? And then if I get up and I say, uh, excuse the physicists in the audience, I've discovered some new elemental particle, what's the first question you're going to ask me? What can I use it for? What use is it, right? Well, that's applied research. And so good, good basic research leads to application, and good application leads to basic questions. And so what we really need, then, is a balanced portfolio of both. As I said, I think the genome sequence, and I'll try to develop this theme as we go along, is an example of how I think we can really make the case for basic research as having a tremendous applied or translational benefit. If, if any of you have seen of the uh, RFA that's come out from AFRI, uh, the new USDA Competitive Funding Program, you notice that the NRC New Biology Report is heavily uh, quoted in that RFA. And uh, what I really like about this report is how strongly plant science is represented in this report. There are four key areas, and they're shown on the right-hand side um, here, uh, four challenges. And if you look at that, plant science applies to all those. And I've, I've bolded those where it's very clearly applicable, but clearly it's also so. For instance, down here in health, we, it's interesting that we spend $30 billion in NIH uh, primarily trying to treat disease, and yet we probably spend, I don't know, a few hundred million in federal dollars trying to actually prevent disease. And we all know now that exercise and good nutrition can go a long way to preventing disease. And so there's a tremendous imbalance in the way we we spend money trying to cure disease when we could save a hell of a lot of money by trying to prevent it. But that's, that's another lecture, not this one. But the other thing we need to keep in mind is to address those challenges that were in that NRC new, new biology report is that most of the agricultural traits that we're interested in are complex traits. The obvious one is yield, you know, uh, people don't really even, a lot of people argue about whether there's such a thing as an actual yield gene. And so in order to address these very complex traits, multigenic traits, we really need a lot more information and better tools to address these things. And again, the genome is so enabling to provide and develop those tools. So it was really a tremendous milestone in the soybean research community when this paper came out uh, earlier this year, uh, presenting then the full genome sequence of soybean. And I, I'll probably thank DOE GAGI three or four times during the seminar, and let me take this opportunity to thank them here for the wonderful job that they did this and bringing the community together and, and so on and so forth. So the soybean genome was a bit of a challenge. It's about a billion base pairs. It's also an allotetraploid, which created challenges. And I'll tell you in a minute, the genome is heavily duplicated. The actual release of the soybean genome was actually in um, December of 2009. Uh, at an international meeting in Mexico, in Puerto Vallarta, a very nice meeting to go to. And um, that sequence then was uh, available uh, for the community. It was, of course, it took a while to get the paper out. So the other thing that you very often, when you talk to com uh, commodity groups, is there's this tendency to equate genomics to, to GMO or genetically modified. I think it's important to remember that the genome, and again, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, that genomes, uh, genomics is more than just sequencing. It's genetic mapping, developing of markers. And it's probably that aspect of marker development which is going to have the most uh, immediate impact on, as far as agriculture. 
Um, and soybean is actually well prepared for this because we have a well um, developed uh, genetic map. A lot of QTLs and a lot of uh, traits have been mapped. We also have a physical map. And now, of course, we can add the genome sequence to that. And well, I was really surprised, very nicely surprised, by how quickly the community actually grabbed a hold of the genome sequence and made some immediate progress. So here I've shown three examples of where people using the knowledge from the genome sequence were able to go in and positionally clone genes involved in agronomic traits. And notice that the, uh, this paper came out already. These papers right now, this is an old slide. And these all relate then to traits that are important, either the nutritional quality or this one down here relates to uh, disease resistance and soybean. Again, that was made possible by the fact that DUEJGI released this sequence in December 2009, and so that was available to the community. And I know there are other papers now that are, that are um, in the process of being published. And so I think you're going to now see very, very rapid progress. As an aside, I'll tell you that a colleague of mine, maybe some of which you know, Peter Gresshoff, who's now in Australia, but we used to be with me at Tennessee, spent well over 10 years trying to positionally clone a gene as soybean. And yet these were done in a in process of about a year. Of course, the genetic populations were available, but the availability of the sequence made that possible. As I mentioned to you, the soybean genome is duplicated. It's thought to have, occur, have had two uh, whole genome duplications, and basically about 75% of the genes are duplicated, and that's created some challenges for us. And there's actually people out there that have walked up to me and told me that you can't make mutations in soybean or you can't get phenotypes in soybean because the genome is so duplicated. And I'll, um, I'll come back to that point in a minute. But one of the problems that it did show us that before the genome was sequenced, we had an aphometrics array, which had about 36,000 uh, gene probes on it. And after we were able to, and this was made from the ESTs, and of course we knew that, that when we made this array that the genome was duplicated. But, uh, and we tried to take all the precautions, but we only had about half the genes or probably less than half the genes in that EST collection. And what we found is that about a third, about only about a third of the probes that are on that array actually map back to a single gene in the genome. The rest of those probes map back to multiple genes. And so basically that aphometrics array that we've used and many people have used is very difficult to actually get accurate gene expression data for single genes. So now uh, Bob Goldberg's lab at UCLA, and we were involved in that, uh, have developed a whole genome aphometrics array for soybean, which is now available. And uh, now we can actually design probes that actually do go back to single genes. Of course, when you get the genome sequence, then you get to get the catalog or the parts list of the various things. And of course, soybean is the number one vegetable oil in the United States. It used to be internationally, but I think palm oil now has surpassed soybean. But it's still domestically, soybean oil is number one. And of course, that's a major uh, uh, concern or a major interest, and of course, also for the production of biodiesel. And so we were able to identify many of the genes involved in lipid metabolism or oil biosynthesis. My own lab was very interested in transcription factors, and we're also able then to map out all the transcription factors in soybean. And I'll draw your attention to this database. The paper uh, just came out in plant biology that actually is a very nice database that Jinling Chang, a bioinformaticist at the University of Missouri developed, which gives you all the transcription factors, puts them in families, and he's actually an expert in protein structure prediction. So in many cases, they've actually uh, predicted the, um, the uh, X-ray crystal structure of the transcription factors, as well as uh, predicted uh, binding sites and so on and so forth. So hopefully that'll be a useful um, uh, website. Now, more recently then, uh, going further from uh, the genome sequence, we conducted uh, Selexa Lumina sequencing. This was done with Greg May and Andrew Farmer at the uh, NCGR in Santa Fe. And we did 14 different tissues. Um, and this is impressed now in Plant Journal. And this just shows kind of a heat map. These are the 20 chromosomes of, uh, of soybean. And where you see the dark colors represent uh, sequences. If you read the uh, paper, Jeremy's paper in, in Nature, there was 46,000 genes predicted with high confidence and maybe as many as 69,000 ORFs. With this data, this sequencing data, now we actually have support for the expression of over 55,000 genes in, in the soybean genome. And this is in a nice searchable um, uh, database here where you can go in and look at genes in, um, under these various conditions.
One of the things, for instance, we did, as I told you, we're interested in transcription factors. So this represents those transcription factors that are selectively expressed in particular tissues. And by that definition, it means that that gene is expressed at least tenfold higher in that tissue than the other 13 tissues that we analyzed. And of course, these obviously then become targets that we could go in and knock out by RNAi, for instance, to look at their role in the development of that particular tissue. Now, one of the things that had not been done in soybean prior to the genome sequence is we didn't have a karyotype map. And um, the uh, reason for it, here's maize chromosomes. You can see how big they are. And the uh, soybean mitotic chromosomes are much larger and also very, very difficult to tell apart. But we wanted, for a variety of reasons, to develop a karyotype. And so Seth Finley, a postdoc in my lab, worked with Jim Birchler, many of you know is really an expert in karyotyping, has done great work in maize, for instance. And we ha now have developed the karyotype of soybean. This shows uh, the, uh, the fish array. Here, here's the probes that were used. And this perhaps shows it in a better way here. So I maybe you in the front can tell, but now we can actually tell apart all 20 chromosomes by, by fish. Now the first application of this is that when doing this, we glycine soja is the wild type progenitor of glycine max, which is the cultivated uh, soybean. And when we were doing that, we noticed, and I, and I stand over here, that there was probes that were originally on uh, chromosome uh, 13 that were now showing up on chromosome 11 and this particular glycine soja line. So there seemed to have been some kind of a natural translocation event between chromosome 11 and chromosome 13. And chromosome 13 is where the nuclear organizing complex is found. And this was of interest to us because there had been reports in the literature that certain crosses between uh, glycine soja and glycine max resulted in a high level of infertility. And what we found was, and that's, uh, there was a, a Reed uh, Palmer at Iowa State University has worked on this. And what he did was introgress this uh, translocation into a, a cultivar of glycine max called Clark. And uh, he showed then that this high for infertility. And what we found was is that this translocation was common in Chinese and Soviet glycine soja accessions, but not in the Korean and Japanese glycine soja accessions. And it's interesting, if you look at the USDA uh, uh, collection of uh, PI uh, plant introductions, there is a, preponderance, uh, a, a high level of Korean and Japanese uh, PIs in that culture collection. It may, in fact, reflect this, uh, this infertility that's seen in these things. And it also suggests, since we don't see it in glycine max, that it actually may have been selected against during domestication. <clears throat> so basically, we went in and we mapped this further. And there appears to be about a 4.2 megabase translocation from chromosome 11 and about 18 trans, uh, megabases from chromosome 13 that have taken place in this um, in this translocation. Now with uh, Reed, Reed has been working on this for years and he had shown that chromosome 13 was involved but didn't know which other chromosome and it only took us a few days by fish to show it was chromosome 11 and now we're going in with a variety of the x-ray translocation events that Reed's been looking on and we've already been able to map uh, several of those and show which chromosomes are have undergone the translocation. <clears throat> So that just shows how the genome sequence allowed us to make pro uh, progress in looking at some of the structural aspects of the genome. Now, of course, I told you we have now expression support for about 55,000 genes in soybean. And so clearly what we're interested in doing is function, trying to get at the function. So the sequencing kind of gives you the parts list, the list of genes, but what we need is function. And in the model legumes, of course, or the model plants like Arabidopsis, we have a variety of different tools. And what's interesting, I think, about the crop plants, and soybean is an example of that, is that we're very rapidly coming up to the same level of resources that we normally would see only in the models. So I told you we have a full genome uh, microarray now. We're doing extensive proteomics, metabolomics, and so on and so forth. We also have stable plant transformation in soybean. There's a very nice viral-induced gene silencing system now, originally developed at Kentucky and then further improved at Iowa State, and then also hair root uh, transformation. So we have all those tools. And then we also have tools for forward uh, genetic analysis, and I'll mention those, and are working on tools also for reverse genetic analysis. So I think one of the revolutions that's taken place, and again, the genomic sequences has led the way, is to bring the crop gene, the crops up to the level 
now where you can actually do the things that were previously only possible in the models. And so I think that's a very exciting development. <clears throat> so where is, uh, well, my lab is primarily interested in nodulation and I won't speak very much about that today. But one of the things since nodulation is a root trait is that we've developed and we've collaborated with Chris Taylor who was at the Danford Center is now at Ohio State. And what Chris did is develop some very nice vectors for doing RNAi and now we can do very nice RNAi silencing using agrobacterium rhizogenes transformation. And this is being used in a variety of labs and is very, very routine, works extremely well. An example of that is shown here. This is a paper we had in plant physiology. We use the constitutive GFP to show which roots are transformed and that's why you get this uh, greenish color. Over here is an empty vector. Here is a RNAi gust that we use to con control, and over here we've silenced a particular gene in apirase, which is an ATPase, and shown that we basically completely disrupt nodulation by doing RNAi silencing. And we have a variety of other genes that we're now um, tackling in this way. Now, of course, what we really like to do is have, I, half of my lab also works in Arabidopsis, and I'll tell you, it's wonderful to simply go into the database, send off an email, and have the mutant arrive in your mailbox a few days later. Uh, and now you can actually get the homozygous mutant. You don't even have to uh, worry about segregating it out and selecting and genotyping. So we were lucky enough, a group of us, to get a grant from the National Science Foundation, the Plant Genome Program, to work on trying to develop uh, mutagenesis tools in soybean. And this is being led by Wayne Parrott, a very able postdoc in his lab, Nathan Hancock, my lab, and Zhang Wan Zhang, who's a, uh, a soybean transformation spe specialist. My wife is working on this project. Tom Clemente, who's another soybean transformation specialist in Nebraska. Uh, Carol Vance's lab and um, one of the research scientists working with, with Carol. And, and we've actually made some very good progress. We just had a, uh, a project meeting in Columbia just before I came here and I was able to get some, some slides to share with you guys. Now, the one paper that we have published in this area in the first uh, mutant that we were able to characterize turned out to be a male sterile. So here's the wild type. You can see viable pollen. Over here you see defective pollen. And this was generated by DS using the maize transposon DS in soybean. And we were able to get the flanking sequence of this and actually found out that the gene from the flanking sequence that was knocked out was a strictocytine synthase, which is involved in this terpenoid indole alkaloid biosynthetic pathway. So knocking out this gene in soybean creates a male sterile, and the same was actually found out to be true in maize. And so once we had the gene and looked in the literature, we found that the same thing had already been shown in maize. And so knocking out this gene both in soybean and in maize relate, uh, results in male sterility. Don't ask me uh, what this pathway has to do with male sterility. I actually talked, this is actually a paper from Pioneer. I talked to the authors at Pioneer and um, they weren't able to tell me either, so I'm um, still a mystery. But interesting that both in maize and soybean you get the same phenotype if you knock out the same gene. Now what we're really exciting about, and this just came out in this uh, project meeting that we had a few days ago, is that uh, Wayne Parrott's lab, uh, being at the University of Georgia, was able to get some transposon vectors from Sue Wessler's lab. And one of the ones, I believe this originally came out of rice, is this ping. And here is the um, autonomous element, and here's the non-autonomous autonomous element. Um, and so similar to uh, AC versus DS. And um, uh, Sue Wessler's lab had made a construct of this such that this non-autonomous element was inserted um, at the beginning of GFP. So when this uh, M-ping element then transposes out, it results then in the expression of the green fluorescent protein. And this is some data that uh, Sue's lab published uh, showing uh, the sectors that they were able to get in a rabbit opposite cod lead. And so I think you can see this uh, green fluorescence sectoring in the leaves. And so what Wayne has been able to do then is actually been able to use this construct. Uh, he slightly modified it. And put it in then to soybean. And this shows then the embryogenic. There's two transformation systems in soybean. One is a somatic embryogenesis system, which Wayne primarily uses. The other is a cut node method that's used in labs like Tom Clemente's lab. And so in this case, you generate these embryos and then can regenerate it. And they use the gene gun to put this in. And the beauty of this system is you can actually then measure already at this uh, this globular stage as to whether or not you're getting GFP expression. And that's what's shown here. 
So this shows one such event. Over here you have white light, over here have the blue light, and I, probably with the lights on you can't see, but trust me, there's some very nice green fluorescence in that case. And so this M ping seems to be going in, and it seems to be transposing. And so now we're still at a very early stage of this, but this represents uh, two events. So here's a, an event up here and up here, and each one of these arrows represents an independent M pink insertion site. <clears throat> and uh, you can see one of the things that comes out obviously is one, you're getting a lot of insertions, enough that we could probably generate a very large population of insertion mutants. They, attempt, they appear to uh, avoid the paracytomeric regions and go into the euchromatic regions, and they appear to transpose to unleaked sites, which of course is also extremely useful and better than what's found, for instance, with the ACDS system. And so it's still early days, and I don't want to oversell this, but I was extremely excited about uh, this result. I think it really opens up the opportunity for us to generate very, very large populations of insertion mutations in soybean. We have about 18 months left on our NSF grant, and we're going to really put some energy into seeing whether or not this system, in fact, can be bulked up to make some uh, mutant populations. The other thing that we've been working on also is fast neutron mutagenesis. And uh, we focused on that because there had been some work in Metacago truncatula where they were using this for reverse genetics. And so what they were doing is making uh, deletions using fast neutron and then using PCR to look for um, uh, deletions in particular genes. But um, <clears throat> we tried that, and uh, we tried about, we made a couple of populations, we tried about 37 genes, were never able to get um, mutations in any of the 37. And then subsequently, talking to people like Michael Avardi at the Nobel Foundation and Giles Orroyd in England, they've pretty much given up on it also. So it's not such a good system for, uh, <coughs> for reverse genetics. But what we have been using it for is actually for genetics. And as I told you, one of the things that we're interested in is uh, nodulation. And so we're actually lucky to get a few nodulation mutants out of our initial screen. We're just in the beginning of really screening these populations to any degree. And um, this shows that here's a fast neutron line 37. You can't see it, but there's nodules up here on Williams 82, which was the cultivar that was uh, sequenced. Uh, and also the cultivar we've used for a fast neutron. And then over here, this particular line forms no nodules at all. So it's completely non-minus. So the question then is how can we rapidly identify the genes that are underlying these fast neutron deletions? So in working with Bob Stupar's lab at the University of Minnesota then, we develop using NimbleGen these uh, comparative genome arrays. And uh, we debated which format to use, but we finally settled on the 3x 70, 720K arrays. This represents 703,000 uh, uh, 703, unique probes from the soybean genome. Again, thanks for the genome sequence, and about 17,000 controls. On average, the LIGOs are about 55 base pairs, and we did it so that we have about an average spacing of about 1.1 KB. The beauty of these arrays, the NimbleGen arrays, is you can actually strip and rehybe them. And so my lab is just really getting into this. Bob's lab has done more. And he's shown that you can actually strip and rehybe them four times. And so uh, with a single slide then, if you're careful, you can actually look, for instance, at 12 different mutants with a single slide. And so it actually starts to become a cost effective. You, you wouldn't want to do 50,000 mutants, but if you had uh, you know, 50 or so that you were interested in, it's within reach of a single lab to, uh, to look at this. And so here represents the results from one such uh, uh, hybridization. Uh, this shows then all 20 chromosomes lined up. And what you're looking for then is you're looking for pixels or hybridizations that fall off this mean. And you can see here a circle, here's one here and another one here. And this one happens to be in chromosome 8, and that's blown up here, and then also in chromosome 10. And looking then at the slide and the actual probes on the slide, we estimate this deletion is about 18 kilobases, and this deletion is about 163 kilobases. Now this actually was our positive control, and this M23 mutant is actually an X-ray mutant that's actually been published on previously, and it turns out that it was uh, isolated originally because it has effects on seed oil content, pri primarily oleic acid, and it turns out that the mutation that's responsible for that is for the fatty acid desaturase. And by PCR, they had estimated the deletion in this line to be 150 KB on chromosome 10. 
and our comparative genome hybridization shows there's a deletion in exactly the same location of about 163 KB. So I'll take that. That's, uh, that's okay. And we then actually did show that within that deletion is the FAD2 gene. So we're pretty pleased the positive control worked. Now we have done a few other mutants. <clears throat> so here is a, a mutant which we call FN34. Um, the seeds are smaller, irregularly shaped. Uh, it may have a trichome phenotype because the, uh, the leaves, you know, the trichomes, the leaves look a little bit different. They're slightly different microscopically. And the plant is a bit bigger, although uh, <clears throat> it's not clear which of these actually segregate with the deletions. And we're also able then to get some nice comparative genome hybridization with that. And so this appears to have two large deletions, one of about two and a half megabases and chromosome 4 and about 2 megabases on chromosome 14 and so very nicely easy to see. Now the way this is supposed to work is that you look for these pixels as I said that fall off this mean and so the question for instance then becomes is that single pixel actually a very very small deletion and of course we've got a lot of work to do to show that the phenotypes are actually segregating with these deletions that we're focused in on as opposed to these others that may be not quite so obvious but at least we now have a system which is affordable that we can rapidly uh, zero in on regions to look at and hopefully then get down to a single gene another one that we've looked at is this one uh, which is a plant which is bigger uh, shows uh, more branching. The seeds are actually a little bit bigger. And we've also done comparative uh, genome hybridization with that. And again, uh, you see you can pick out some very nice uh, deletions that then we'll have to follow by segregation and see what uh, co-segregates uh, with, uh, with the phenotype. So we're very excited about this comparative genome hybridization. So the MPing system looks, I think, quite interesting. And this fast neutron system looks quite interesting. So what about the future? Um, again, the, the genome sequence has just been a huge catalyst and really has sped forward progress. So there's already a soybean hat map underway. Uh, there's talk about creating a soybean orpheum. I, I could give you a whole seminar on all the systems biology work that we've done, meta, me, metabolomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, some of which with the Environmental Molecular Science Lab at PNNL that was mentioned in a previous and tiling arrays and so on and so forth that's, that's uh, going on. And talk now about having to have a stock center just like they have, for instance, a rabidopsis to take care of all those, those mutants. And so I think the future is extremely bright for corn as it is, I think, for some of the other crop genomes uh, that, for which they have a sequence. So if I can conclude then, the soybean genome sequence has already been a huge catalyst for rapid progress. So thanks again, DOEJHI. Crop plants are rapidly approaching resource levels previously only seen with model plants. And I think perhaps this is the most exciting aspect. And I think it's really going to be a point where, where you can start to ask, the, ask what is the best plant system to answer the question. In the past, it's always been instantly the answer is a rabidopsis. But I think now with these resources that are going on with the crops, I think you need to think a little bit more carefully about that answer. And it may in fact be that soybean or corn or rice or one of the other plants that actually may be a better system to address the question you're interested in. There's tremendous potential to use these resources to improve agronomic performance of soybean, both qualitative traits and quantitative traits. And soybean itself can become a model to study key traits. It's very clear that Arabidopsis does not equal all plants. An example is mycorrhizal symbiosis that Arabidopsis doesn't have. <clears throat> but clearly, uh, seed oil, due to the fact that it's important as a vegetable oil, high protein content plant, biological nitrogen fixation, which is my interest, polyploidy, and a variety of others. <clears throat> the success with soybean argues that more effort should be placed on deducing the genomes of other crop plants and evolutionary related species. So that's, I'm here at DOE JGI, you can't get away without making your pitch. So here's my pitch. And then my other pitch is that in my opinion, we also need to do more to capture the value and natural variations of populations. And here that's where the high throughput sequencing technology. So I think there's a lot that could be done with natural variation. Uh, even though we're working on mutagenesis, I think there's still a lot of potential there. <clears throat> so here are the people in my lab that I want to thank. Uh, in this business, in modern science, you can't get by without uh, a lot of help from your friends. And uh, we certainly have had a lot of friends as well as uh, ample funding. And again, my last thank you to DOE JGI, um, not to be overbearing. And uh, not sure how I did on time, but I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh,
questions for Gary? Say that again. I didn't get the last part. Yeah, it was normalized data. It was also normalized for uh, copy number and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, I was about ready to say a bad word, but it's a, it's a lot of data. And so, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stories coming out. So, for instance, one of the things that we've done is looked at those genes that are very, very highly specific for particular tissues. And you can find relatively few genes, it's less than 10 genes, that actually show uh, over a thousand fold enrichment in one tissue versus the other. And we're very interested in looking at, at those, genes, the, those genes, for instance. And we've also focused in on nodulation, comparing different tissues, and yeah, there's a lot of stuff to be done. Um, a lot of stuff to be done. The paper should be out in Plant Journal pretty soon.